this week on the Hypothetically Podcast. This week I interview Mike Quackenbush. He's most well known as the founder and patriarch of the Chikara wrestling promotion. It's a very colorful universe and it's uh, oftentimes described as being like a live action comic book. I believe that professional wrestling is the most compelling type of performance art on the planet. Sometimes distilling it to a uh, cute sound bites a lot like grabbing a porcupine. There's no good way to go at it. Uh, I don't know that I've ever enjoyed the type of in-ring chemistry I have with another performer that I had with Cesaro. And uh, when he left, in some small way, I think a little bit of my passion for the craft went with him. He would look down at me and be like, no, you can come up a little bit more. Let's go. Come on. Uh, a little bit more out of you. I know you have it in you. And I know, I know maybe somebody else isn't going to draw it out of you, but I will. And uh, I sincerely miss that about my friend. Because there's certainly a mindset among some in wrestling, I know some secret information and I'm not going to give it to you. You'll use it to get ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't want to play with you. Like, stay home in your yeah. cave. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. Because eventually, I may need to trust you with my life. I'm going to let you... I'm going to put my, literally, I'll put my body in your hands and trust that you are not going to kill me. Yeah. But before we can have that type of trust, I need to know that you're the guy that can sweep the canvas. Right, yeah. Those were uh, wrestling road trip essentials in the car. Were those yeah. first two, <laughs> Dane Cook. Um, there was, uh, in the early days when Shikara would hit the road a lot, we would take stand-up albums on the road to en keep ourselves entertained. Because sometimes you're, you know, trapped in a car that smells of protein shakes, farts, and defeat <laughs> for, uh, you know, ten hours at a time. You're listening to the Hypothetically Podcast with Will Noonan. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is where you are. Thank you for listening to Hypothetically with Will Noonan. That's me, coming at you live this time from my house. It's another interview episode, but this one is fantastic. This week I interviewed Mike Quackenbush. If you don't know who Mike Quackenbush is, he's been in the wrestling business for about 20 years. He's most well known as the founder and patriarch of the Chikara Wrestling Promotion. If you don't know Chikara... It's one of the coolest and most fun independent wrestling promotions out there. If you're not a wrestling fan, if you're ever going to get into wrestling, Chikara is probably the promotion uh, that'll get you to do it. A lot of guys from there have been on the show before. Jervis Cottonbelly, the Estonian Thunder Frog. Um, <clears throat> they're both involved with Chikara. They're both awesome. Um, me and Mike get into the detail about what it is, but just real quick, it's kind of like a comic booky mixed with lucha, mixed with Japanese stuff, but the thing is, it's just really hip and funny, and the shows are just the most entertaining good time you're going to have, so like, check out ChikaraPro.com, and just look into some of their stuff, if you're into like, TV shows, like, comic books, anything like that, you're going to like Chikara, and who doesn't love TV shows and comic books, everybody does, so... <clears throat> they got the Ashes of Shikara films, which you can watch on YouTube, which are these cool kind of vignettes that go with the storylines. But just check out the website, ChikaraPro.com. And on May 25th, if you're in Philadelphia, you can go see the, um, oh man, what the heck is it called? You Only Live Twice. Yeah, they're going with that 007 kind of theme this year. Um, and that's Sunday, May 25th at the Palmer Center in Pennsylvania. Check out ChikaraPro.com. All the cool stuff they have is there. But um, I think you guys are going to really like this podcast a lot. We talk about all the different pro wrestlers that have passed through. Chikara guys who wrestle for the WWE. Big famous guys like Cesaro and CM Punk and Daniel Bryan, the most famous guy in the game right now. And we talk about all that. And... We just get into kind of artistic philosophies. If you're any kind of performer uh, or artist, Mike is a really eloquent, well-spoken guy, and he talks a great deal about how wrestling is performance art. We talk a great deal about the creative aspects of wrestling. And uh, it's just a really cool interview. I'm proud of it. I think you're going to like it. So sit back, relax, and enjoy my conversation with Mike Wackenbush. <laughs> Hello, 
Hello, Mike Quackenbush. How are you, sir? I'm well, thank you. <laughs> uh, for the listener out there, I am now talking to Mike Quackenbush, the founder and patriarch of Chikara, uh, one of my favorite wrestling promotions, independent wrestling promotions, and uh, it's just it's great to talk to you, sir. How are you? I'm very well, and I'm glad we finally got to connect, because uh, I, I feel like this has been a long time in the making. It has. It has, it, it, like a Chikara storyline, this has been a long time in the making, and it had many levels. But yeah, uh, you're, I, I'm really excited to talk to you. You're a super um, busy guy, and you've got so much going on. But uh, for you know, f- some of my listeners, they don't know what Chikara is, but I often have talk, I've talked about over the past year, um, just because I talk about my life, and I, I'm a fan of Chikara. So I've been talking about mm. this wrestling promotion that I like, and... Um, I talked about some of the wrestling is shows that I went to so people know a little bit about it and they know Jervis a little and then the Estonian Thunder Frog but Great. if you if you had to uh, just for the people out there who never heard anything like could you just describe it a little bit to them or just an sure. idea of what it is yeah I'll try to give you a little bit of background on and I'll, I'll be fair it, it sometimes distilling it to uh, cute sound bites a lot like grabbing a porcupine there's no good way to go at it yeah but, true um, <laughs> Uh, I believe that professional wrestling is the most compelling type of performance art on the planet. And I'm surrounded by a wonderful cast and crew of people with towering talent that try to make wrestling as fun as possible for everybody. It never wants to insult your intelligence. It never wants to treat its audience with contempt. It never wants to exclude anybody. It should be, to me, uh, wrestling should be just as acceptable to younger viewers as it is to older viewers, regardless of what your education level is or your race or your ethnic background or any of that Mm -hmm. it it, it should be acceptable to all um and that's like the guiding principle behind uh what we make it's a very colorful universe and it's uh oftentimes described as being like a live action comic book Mm -hmm. um i think you'll see that echoed in the way that we like to tell our stories uh certainly the visual aesthetic Mm -hmm. of our characters uh, most obviously perhaps of all and in tons of other little elements as well so if you're the kind of uh, person like I was, I grew up uh, reading comic books uh, by the metric ton and consuming superhero media no matter where it was. You know, I'd watch it on my television any way I could get that. Um, if that sort of thing appeals to you, then I, I suspect that you might also uh, find some enjoyment and some uh, delight in what we make at Chikara. Absolutely. I think that's dead on. And in the live action comic book aspect of it is is something um it's it's just dead on and you feel it when you're there you feel as a part as a part of the crowd you feel you're in, it's just good versus evil you're rooting for these guys bright costumes and like you said never insulting your intelligence just a family family friendly but adult friendly it's 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 just great i love it we all well, love chikar <laughs> i'm glad that that lets me know that we're all doing our job well because it really is a giant cast and crew of people that make this thing happen. And a lot of times in those situations, it really only takes one or two apples not getting on with what everybody else is doing and can ruin the experience for the audience. And um, we are a, an organization of, of folks that are really obsessed with making certain our audience gets the exact right experience. Mm-hmm. Um, those that are willing to let us into their lives and they do make an emotional investment in our characters and what's going on in our universe – they go on a real ride with us. Uh, I mean, the last two years have really been evidence to that. Absolutely. Um, they go on a really crazy ride with us. And uh, we, we do have to take great care. We have to make certain that uh, we, we're delivering uh, the right experience to them. And, um, but doing it in, in those ways that I described, right? You don't want to insult their intelligence. You don't want to treat them with contempt. Because I do see that being done other places. And as someone who's been involved in wrestling for the last 20 years, I've seen that whether it's been places uh, where I've worked or places that I've just studied, um, I see that being done. And to me, that turns me off as a viewer because at heart, I'm a wrestling fan first and foremost. Before I was ever involved, I was a fan. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I want to deliver to other people the exact same type of joy I once derived from the medium. I think... A lot of the opinion, negative opinions about professional wrestling that, that people have that don't really know wrestling at all are what you're talking about. You know, they've seen things 
just in passing on television that sort of insulted them in some way. And then they just gave up on the whole sport because of that one thing. And I think those type of people, if that's of the mindset you are listening, it's, it's, this is the opposite of that. You're going to go, you'll have a smile on your face. You'll leave with a smile on your face and just the characters are great and fantastic. I wanted to talk to you about May 25th. Um, for the person who's listening, who doesn't know much about Jakar, how can uh, we tell them this is such an important day because it's after National Pro Wrestling Day, which was sort of the return. This is the official real return after a year of people really waiting for Chikar to come back. Uh, yeah, you're exactly right about that. So uh, we are in Easton, Pennsylvania at the Palmer Center on May 25th. And if you can't be there to join us live, you can also stream it live via the magic of iPay-Per-View. That's and, right. Uh, all the information about tickets and ordering, and for example, you can get that at our website, ChikaraPro.com. But this marks the beginning of our 14th season, and it's probably, for the first time in several years, a really obvious jumping-on point for the new viewer. Mm -hmm. um, this is a great place to get in because um, our mythology can be not only dense but a little intimidating to new fans, much <laughs> in the same way that I feel about Doctor Who. Uh, <laughs> I have people come up to me all the time that tell me the last couple seasons of Doctor Who, you would love them if you would just you know, dive into the pool – yeah. And then I might Wikipedia, you know, want to know a little bit about it. And I'm like, is this really season 49 of Doctor Who? Because I don't know I want to get in 49 seasons deep. Yeah. Um, I'm intimidated by that mythology. So I, I do have a real understanding of um, how and why people might feel that way. But this is a great place to jump on. Um, it, it, it really marks the beginning of a new era in Chikara because, as we had sort of um, cryptically alluded to a moment or two ago, um, the last two years uh, have seen a, a really outside-the-box type story unfold. Um, and uh, all of that is kind of moving into its next phase now. Yeah. And you said uh, – something you said earlier that I really want to bring back around is the performance art aspects of professional wrestling. And um, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm not a lifetime fan. I, um, I had – you know, I always had an interest in pro wrestling, and I would watch – the my brother was a big fan, and I would definitely watch growing up in the 90s. And um, But I kind of dropped off, and then only – being a stand-up comedian and getting to know other comedians, uh, there just so happens to be this big scene in Boston of comedians who are wrestling fans. Mm -hmm. wow. And That's yeah, it, it's really interesting. And there's like these 20 guys who I who I ended up being friends with through comedy. They um, they throw uh, pay-per-view parties and uh, stuff like that. So I started going, and I saw guys like Daniel Bryan and. Um, Cesaro and CM Punk and guys I really had not seen like I'd heard the name CM Punk just from some of the awesome sort of promos he was cutting through through people but it was this new style of wrestling that was it was totally new to me I growing up I didn't know they wrestled in Japan I didn't know what mm -hmm. awesome stuff was going on over there so the influence of that coming in and the, and the new sort of I don't know how to describe it correctly but it's just a more sort of athletic style um and i really liked it and then it just got me into the whole world of indie wrestling because i wanted to go see shows and then i started getting into chikara through that watching online i downloaded and printed out a 25 page fan made uh story now you guys have a very easy to read three page synopsis of all the history Mm -hmm. But I printed out like a novel and read it. And uh, I think I know the one you're yeah. talking about because I saw somebody with it. I said, what is that thing? It's like I'm a like, script. Yeah, Right. It was like a fan made this. It was so impressive. It was unbelievable. And I'm in there. I'm a grown man comedian and I'm on the road highlighting things in here like it's a, like it's a test. But I'm just like, oh, OK, this is an important point. I have to remember this. And I kind of caught myself up on it over a few days. I'm still confused sometimes, but that doesn't matter. <laughs> I love it anyway. But it's it's beautiful and it's good versus evil. And it's funny over the year, over the past year, really, I while well, you guys were sort of putting it together and getting this all to come back in May, I've been watching all the old stuff and catching up and it's just, it's a great thing to get into, but to call it performance art is really, I think what brought me in, um, as a comedy fan, as an actor, as everything I was, I watched it through a different going to see an indie show live. I was like, this is, this is be like a beautiful form of entertainment here. And these guys are 
comedians, they are actors, they are stuntmen, and this is and and they are dancers, and this is just like a beautiful thing. And I really kind of s- fell in love with wrestling overnight, you know. And um, I think Chikara is really represents what's best about that. Well, my, thank you. That's yeah. very kind of you to say. I think there are a lot of parallels to be found, and uh, this is coming from someone I know a lot about wrestling and not a lot about comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think there are certain parallels, at least as we look at the type of performance arts that we that we do. In that there are those occasions where you must walk directly out to center stage with the spotlight on you and fail. Yes. You have to bomb. Oh, yeah. You, you will not improve unless you're willing to take that chance. And uh, I like to define that to the guys that I train at Chikara Wrestle Factory um, – or sometimes, you know, if I go and teach a seminar somewhere else at another wrestling school, or for whatever reason I'm out talking about uh, wrestling, is that like comedy, I believe, and I'd like for you to speak about this as well, is mm-hmm. um, you are treading this razor's edge as a performance artist. I am balancing between success and failure. And uh, I could fall. I could bomb. I could, I could fall flat on my face and fail, and the crowd might hate what I do or what I offer on this day, uh, you know, what I've made. And I imagine in my head as I craft this that you're going to love it, but I walk out there and either I've you know, misjudged it or uh, it's not the audience that I expected it would be or any number of factors, mm-hmm. and, and it bombs. And likewise, I'm just as likely to get a tremendous ovation, and it's going to be warmly received and loved by everyone, <laughs> and it will deliver the exact joyous experience to the paying customers that we want. And you have to constantly walk that razor's edge. And uh, if you're not willing to, if you're not willing – and that's a very precarious place to be. It comes with all types of anxiety, and uh, I'm, I'm certainly the kind of person that second-guesses myself a lot of times about that. Or um, After the fact, I go back and I self-criticize. Um, I, I once heard uh, a comedian named Jimmy Corain who's based out of Chicago. He makes a wonderful podcast called Improv Nerd, reflecting on his own performance shame. And uh, <laughs> I'd, I'd never heard that phrase before, and I was like, wow. I was like, this guy's a wrestler at heart. He doesn't know it, uh, <laughs> but he really is. Um, you, you have to be willing to walk that razor's edge. You can't just do the comfortable pat stuff, like the bag of tricks type stuff that you know always works. You can make that choice. You can, but I don't think you're ever really going to grow as a performer when you do. Yeah, no one's going to be shocked or impressed by anything you do, really, if you're doing the same old stuff. Yeah. It's uh, no, it's it's definitely the same. It's so I I talk with a lot of wrestlers up here about that when when we're uh, when we're, when I go to the shows that the lifestyles are the same, and we we both depend and feed on this crowd, and we talk about them as an audience, as a crowd, as a singular thing. But like you said, you never know what you're going to get when you walk out there. And they are the, they are your performer. Um, as a comedian, I'm always on stage alone. So mm-hmm. it's me and them. But as a wrestler, it's you two guys, maybe the ref too, and them. And it's this, you know, some audience members know how much of an effect they have on the comedian or the wrestler. And some audience members don't. Mm-hmm. But it's, uh, I, I mean, I can only speak for comedy, but we, we react off of them and they really let us know What's going on? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I once heard uh, stand-up comedian Jamie Campbell make the remark about how um, no matter how his set would go as a stand-up, whether he bombed or whether he felt like uh, you know it, it got over like gangbusters or, or whatever the stand-up <laughs> comedy uh, expression that goes with that is. Yeah, um, killed, crushed. Right, okay, great, yeah. great, killed, of course. I should have thought of that. Um, whether he bombed or he, or he killed out there. His internal response was the same in that if he bombed, he felt like, I must find another place to stand up tonight, even if it's an open mic, to get that out of my system so that I, I'm, I don't walk around carrying that till next weekend that I bombed. But he feels the exact same way when he killed because he wants to perpetuate that feeling. <laughs> that gives you such an emotional high. And that's, that can very much be the case, you know, even though if you want to think of it as an ensemble performance, wrestling, whereas stand-up, you know, generally speaking, it's just you. Yeah. Um, you know, so maybe in that way, wrestling is more like sketch or improv in that you're part of a team. Yeah. Um, regardless, you do get that. If you go out there and it gets over like gangbusters and you get this tremendous ovation and the audience is returning to you the same joy that you tried to give to them, that is an emotional high that's very difficult to replicate. Oh, yeah. Especially when, you know, the vast majority of these types of performers at our level go back to a 9 to 5 Monday through Friday where what they're doing is probably not their passion but a, a means to an end. Mm-hmm. So, like, for me, for 10 straight years, I worked in a cubicle at a company that manufactured packaging products like bubble wrap. Wow. 
So you can imagine if Saturday and Sunday I'm out there getting uh, very warm ovations, uh, and you can imagine the emotional high that that might give a performer. But then Monday through Friday, I'm just answering angry customer complaints because they got sent the wrong size bubble. Oh. Um, so <laughs> I, I, I really understood where Jamie Campbell was coming from when he made that analogy about. Yeah, I, I, I when you said it, I was like, "Yep, that's me too." I, uh, I hear that <laughs> loud and clear. And there's also this whole sometimes uh, it looks effortless when it's done well, you know, and people will go. Oh, that was so amazing. You know, just like, oh, that was no big deal. <laughs> like, I, I really suck at this. Like, that's how I kind of am sometimes. I get down. Like, I feel like even when it's a great performance, there's things that went wrong that I could have fixed. And when it's a bad performance, I almost feel like, yeah, you, you saw you saw the real me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I try to tell my guys, um, because uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a weird space uh, as I mentioned, I've been in pro wrestling now 20 years, but I'm also yeah. training people who are coming in. So I'm seeing them like on their first day. Yeah. So um, I see this weird spectrum where I'm at versus some people who are just coming in or people that are maybe halfway through my arc. They've been in it for a couple of years and they've got some experience, but they've still got they've still got a way to go. Um, and uh, they come back from a match where uh, we instinctively were our own worst critics. We're overanalyzing oh, yeah. every move that we made. Should I place this here? Should this have happened like that? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, because you want to know, like, what could we have done that would have gotten a better, a better reaction or that? And at, at the end of most performances, the truth is the audience does have a good time. And uh, it is important at times to remember that the, that particular level of nuance or the form or those types of nuts and bolts things are important to you, the performer, but it is the show that is important to the audience. Mm -hmm. And if you gave them what you wanted to give them, like let's say on this particular day we wanted them to leave with a euphoric feeling or today we wanted them to leave with a sense of suspense going into what's next or whatever. Yeah. If we all work together and we all, we all left the audience the way we wanted to – even if along the way, well, maybe we could have put this screw into the device over here or we could have changed the shape of that. Um, I think what, it's far more important what you've left your paying customers and your supporters and your fans with um, than it is those types of things. And uh, I've gotten to a point now where I, I, I like to try to counsel my younger guys, like, put that aside. Like, don't mm -hmm. get bogged down in that type of stuff. Like, uh, really just kind of focus on, on the positives and, and take that with you. Because a lot of times, you know, if you go back to your nine to five job, Monday through Friday, like I'd rather you carry that with you through the week than agonizing over all oh, this bogus thing that we did or, yeah. you know, that and cause you, it can wear you down. And it's like you said earlier, that's how you grow as an artist. You're going to fail and that's, and it's going to sting a little bit, but that's how you won't do it again. And that's how you'll make, you know, won't make the same mistakes over and over again. And, you have to have, and especially in 2014, you have to have a thick skin in any type of performance uh, because people can just get at you all the time now. <laughs> right, very much so. I think I had read a quote around the time that Cirque du Soleil had produced the uh, musical Love and Sir George Martin had gone back into the studio, and he I don't know if you recall, but he remixed some of the Beatles, Beatles tracks yeah. for that, right? <laughs> Which some people were saying was like sacrilege. And uh, he came right out and said, he said, if the Beatles were active in the age of social media, they would have just quit after the first album. Uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> so you're That's exactly true. right about having thick skin. Um, you will never get to your greatest work. You will never be able to share your, your, the maximum potential of your talent if you allow that to bog you down. Yeah, no, it's definitely true, and I, and it can be a battle, you know. It's it's definitely easier said than done. Sometimes I think sometimes myself, I'm like, oh, I don't listen to the, I don't care if someone shits on me on Twitter or you know on uh, Reddit says I'm not funny, but like that's ninety eight percent true. There's still that two percent of me that's like, hey, why can't everyone think I'm the funniest guy in the world? You know what I mean? It's just mm -hmm. it's part of it's part of what makes you an artist, I think. Yeah, but you're right about that. That doesn't mean uh, that it doesn't sting. Yeah. Um, you can put on a brave face, of course, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't sting. And a lot of times I have to remind myself of, of this because uh, the type of performance art that, that I'm involved in or the kind that, that you're involved in, um, it, there will always be someone that it's not for. And uh, I sometimes think about this. Uh, one of the things uh, I do outside the world of wrestling is I make a podcast called The Trending Show. And mm -hmm. when I make the trending show, in preparation for that, I usually end up reading on a given week maybe between 80 and 100 articles that were the top trending stories throughout the week. 
So uh, I have to know, uh, all right, so I'm going to read these, and maybe there's nothing really funny in any of these or anything grabs my attention, but I do have to read them all to figure out, you know, if I read 80, I'll shake 10 out. Right. That I do think are funny or like this has something – there's something really weird here. And I it never ceases to amaze me reading news stories about people. When I'm done reading this article, all I can think is this person like from another planet. <laughs> I cannot understand you know, uh, whether – like just recently something that, that's been in the news a lot is the uh, terrorist group in northern Nigeria that abducted 300 schoolgirls. Yeah. And they're still holding 233 of them. And reading some of the statements from this terrorist group's leadership, like what they believe about the world. Like, hey, this is my religion, is to go out and capture people and make them my slave. <laughs> yeah. I can sell nine-year-old girls uh, into sex slavery or human traffic them because my religion says it's okay. And I read that and I think, I can't even... I have zero relation to what you are saying. Uh, you could just be some crazy – you could be Thanos. You're like this <laughs> evil, world-devouring supervillain from the other side of the universe that I don't understand at all. Um, and so I, I just kind of uh, have to remind myself uh, there are people like that out there so far removed from the things I understand that I believe about the world or even just the things that I like – there's no way everybody's going to be like, we love what you're doing all the time. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> uh, it's so true. It is. It's uh, it's one of the hardest parts about being a performer. But I think that's kind of also the thrill of the chase a little bit. You're trying. You're constantly trying to get this fickle public to uh, mm -hmm. to get into the things you're into. I wanted to ask you, you've been wrestling a long time for such a young guy. And I know a lot of comedians, myself included, we look back on our early – shows in our early stages of our career and kind of cringe a little bit uh do you have anything you look back on and feel that way about oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah because people love that kind of stuff mike you know <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad because i've made ample material to satisfy any appetite they're like, I only want the cringeworthy stuff he did. <laughs> there are volumes of it, volumes uh, to devour. Um, well, well, give us a tale because, I, I mean, I've, <laughs> I've stuck my foot in my mouth a million times, so I'm sure we can trade stories. Uh, but as a young – because I, I think when you're a wrestler or a comic, you come in, you're kind of a boy coming into a man's world, and it's sort of like – a baptism by fire because you're working kind of right away and you're thrown into this mix and you're trying at least i can speak for myself i was trying to sort of uh get in with the boys a little bit and just uh be cool and that was the dumbest thing i possibly could have done but <laughs> looking back but i embarrassed myself a lot so i imagine wrestling's a little similar of course like no one comes to these types of things hoping to be further ostracized. Like, <laughs> you, you come to it craving some kind of community. You, I need to, for, for whatever reason, right? And there are lots of different reasons performers are attracted to their particular discipline. But there is something particular about those that feel like I'm going to walk out into a room full of strangers and get a reaction. Whether that is I want, them, I want to make them laugh or I want to make them cheer. Or some performers, I want to make them boo and hiss. I want them to hate me. Whatever that thing mm -hmm. might be that you're trying to elicit, um, no, no performer wants to exist in a vacuum. You know, uh, I'm going out and I, I, I want a certain type of reaction from, from this community out here, the audience, and then I, I probably want acceptance from fellow comedians I want, or, or fellow professional wrestlers or whatever mm -hmm. that thing might be. Um, nobody's like, I, <laughs> I hope I make no, no relationships. <laughs> uh, I don't do any networking. So, of course, I totally get that because – I'm sure just like in the world of comedy, in the world of wrestling, there's a protracted period where you are paying your dues. You're the Big lowest time. rung at, you know, all the worst jobs, the worst gigs, the, the, the most mind-numbing responsibilities. Mm -hmm. All those are given to you when you're the bottom guy. And you want to prove yourself like, hey, I'm better than this. Like, hey, you know I, I can contribute more. Mm -hmm. But at least in wrestling, uh, there is certainly a feeling like you're going to prove that you can handle the easiest thing. And you can do it consistently before anyone's going to trust you with something more. Because eventually, I may need to trust you with my life. I'm going to let you – I'm going to put my – literally, I'll put my body in your hands and trust that you are not going to kill me. Yeah. But before we can have that type of trust, I need to know that you're the guy that can sweep the canvas. 
Yeah. Um, and, and it takes a while to kind of work your way up and, and earn the trust uh, of the people that came before you and, and blazed a path for you so that uh, one day you, you can do what it is that you want to do as well. Um, as a trainer, do you see the different personalities as they come in? I mean, I'm sure some students are just ready to learn and very humble, but I'm sure other kids or guys come in and they're kind of cocky and they think they know it all. Oh, yeah. So mm-hmm. must There's be kind a, of – a big strata. You know, but you do start to see, you know, uh, the patterns start to emerge mm-hmm. after you've, you know, I, I don't even know now at this point, you know, we maybe had a dozen or more terms of students pass through the wrestle factory. Uh, you start to, you realize that, like, this is the guy that thinks he's already got it all figured out. Um, yeah. This is the person that doesn't know where they're going in life. And this was like on their bucket list and they had a few weeks off and they're like, let's go do this. Yeah. Um, you know, it, you just kind of start to see that. And every once and again, there's a wild card, which is great. Like, uh, always up for a wild card in the mix. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, uh, yeah, yeah, you do start to see the patterns because I'm sure, like, in comedy, there are certain uh, certain personality types that are attracted to that type of mm-hmm. performance. Yeah, definitely. And you get and you get people – It's a, some people come in with different skill sets. Like, some people are great joke writers, but they're very – they can't perform. And then other people are very comfortable in front of a crowd, but they have nothing to say, you know. And then it mm-hmm. takes – they have to – you know, they just have to learn what they don't know yet. And it's, it's, it's like you said, I think both of us are, are in these sort of old fashioned forms of, um, entertainment in the sense that, you know, it's live, it's, it's theater. It's, uh, they've both been around for a long time and it's, uh, and there's still traditions involved, like dues paying and, and sweeping the canvas and, uh, in comedy wise, you would have to, you know, sort of just physically be in the club and not do anything for a couple weekends before someone would ask you hey go up there and tell them to turn off their cell phones before the show and then a couple weeks later you get to actually do a couple minutes and bring the host on or then after that you get to host and then like literally years later you're in the middle you know it's Mm -hmm. like uh it's a slow thing and there's there's a lot of uh, i'm sure with wrestling and comedy there's a lot of times punching your steering wheel, banging your head against the steering wheel, like, what did I do in there? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and I think I think that's part of what I love about it. And I also, you don't need a lot of technology to put on a comedy show or a wrestling show. You just need a stage or a ring and great uh, talent, and you can do it. Right. You know? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think uh, <laughs> sometimes it's best... Uh, and that's not to say that there isn't fun in, in seeing it both ways, but sometimes when you see it stripped down to just the bare essentials, yeah. um, you know, uh, a, ri- a, a ring that's by itself, uh, I contrast that maybe against if you saw WrestleMania 30, which <laughs> just had this mind-boggling level of production. Huge. Um, right. This massive spectacle in front of 75,000 people. And uh, they're, likewise, you know, I'm sure – uh, for a while, I could be wrong, right? But didn't Jerry Seinfeld do like an arena level tour? Like maybe not long after Seinfeld was um, he was up, he was doing like yeah, it wasn't necessarily like arenas, but it was the biggest theaters in the country. So he would be doing massive three thousand, four thousand seat theaters. Right, where I'm sure he, you know he's like a tiny speck up on yeah. the stage, like. Somebody in the way back with their opera glasses is trying to. Yeah. Is, that, is that really Jerry Seinfeld? I mean, Dane, like Dane Cook and Kevin Hart do arenas where hockey teams play you know i mean they do 30,000 seat places and that i can't even imagine one man one microphone and all that you know mm-hmm. uh, i don't know uh I, i'm not all that plugged into the world of stand-up but it seemed to me like dane cook had a couple of years where he was rising so fast but in the last few years I, I don't think i've heard his name at all yeah he um you know, he had kind of a Ben Affleck run of fame where it was like people loved him, loved him, loved him, and then he got overexposed, and he just decided to take a few years off <laughs> from mm-hmm. from big projects. I'm actually uh, kind of a fan of his. I don't. I I think he lost people on those big. He did it. He did one special where it was his first big special. It was like in a in a. I think it was in the Boston Garden, which holds like. 20,000 or something like that Mm -hmm. and even that I think is okay but where he made the mistake was he did a few he did about four or five bits from his last special and I think his diehard fan base felt kind of ripped off by that Mm. and he lost some fans and he ended up putting out a a statement saying like well these these are like songs and people want to hear the hits and uh, I think that hurt him for a few years and I think the backlash from that kind of caused him to um, 
stay away for a little while, but his early albums are fantastic. But Right, yeah. Those were uh, Wrestling Road Trip Essentials in the Car, were those yeah. first two, <laughs> Dane Cook. Um, there was, uh, in the early days when Shikara would hit the road a lot, we would take stand-up albums on the road to en- keep ourselves entertained, because sometimes you're, you know, trapped in a car that smells of protein shakes, farts, and defeat <laughs> for, uh, you know, ten hours at a time. So yeah. Mitch Hedberg was on the road with us as much as anybody. You know, Dane Cook was. Um, a stand-up that, that uh, I used to love, and uh, his act's really changed, and his material and everything else has changed as he's aged, and he doesn't resonate with me quite as much anymore, but I used to force Jake Johansson on my guys. Oh, I uh, love Jake Johansson, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I, I really like his unique insight and things like that, and uh, my, my other favorite stand-up, in particular what I like about him is the fact that he works clean, is Brian Regan. Oh, uh, yeah. That guy never ceases to find... Something new, and I've heard so many different sets of material from him that are all completely different. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I got to see him live, and uh, to a point like echoing what Dane Cook had said, at the end of his set, he ad- he took requests, yeah, and it was like people yelling out his greatest hits, and then he would repeat, you know, like oh that I've heard that on that one album of his, like that's one of his most famous bits, and people enjoyed that just as much. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a cool way to do it, like to do a do a new hour and then say, okay, you want any, you want the old ones? Let's do them, you know. Right, and to an extent, that's part of the experience. That's part. It's ritual. Yeah. Um, I remember when when I was coming up, the uh, the WWF champion and and the most pushed character in that company was Bret the Hitman Hart. Mm-hmm. That was very much my era, and uh, like uh, when I started to get into reading wrestling magazines, when my my fandom uh, started moving in that type of direction, or I'd started to connect with other wrestling fans. Uh, at the time, it was easy to make this criticism, and it's made of of all the major players, from Hulk Hogan to Bret Hart, and I'm sure people say this about John Cena right now. Um, it's like, oh, man, you know, he, he just does those same five moves I see on television. <laughs> like, all, that's all. But there is a ritual to, I'm sure if, if you know, predating when I really became invested, if I went to a match where Hulk Hogan was wrestling... I wanted to see him do the leg drop. Yep. I, I wanted to be part of that. In the same way, like, if uh, I went to a big arena band, like, if I went and saw Journey in an arena and they didn't play Don't Stop Believing, you know, oh, like, yeah. that, that's part of the experience <laughs> I came for. And, yes, we've all heard that song 500 times before. You know, we've all seen Bret Hart do the pendulum backbreaker, the side Russian leg sweep, the thing where yeah. he holds his own elbow and jumps off the second rope. The sharpshooter, yes, but part of that is the ritual. Like these are the things that I've come. I, I take an enjoyment or a pleasure from Journey playing "Don't Stop Believing" or you know whatever those things are, and that is an important part of the performance. You're right. Is to give that uh, to the fan base. Um, I, I, as a as a little bit of a side note on that, I heard something uh, that I was really charmed by. I'm a big fan of British singer songwriter Nick Lowe. He's probably best known for a modest hit he had at the end of the 70s called Cruel to be Kind. But, yeah, I know. Um, yeah. You Great probably song. do know Nick Lowe. Yeah. yeah, he, yeah. Um, he probably made most of his money, though. He wrote a song called What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding that's been covered by tons of people. Yeah, Elvis um, Costello. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I saw Nick Lowe at a very intimate, dirty, dusty theater uh, playing in front of 100 fans or less. This guy who, uh, you know, he's... A, multi-decade troubadour of rock and he got to the end of his set and uh i, I would guess that nick Lowe now is probably in his 60s or 70s mm-hmm. very qu- quiet soft-spoken he, he looked like my grandfather up there uh plucking an acoustic guitar um and he said this which really inspired some of my own thought process about performance he said uh, i know many of you took time to travel here to be here at this theater to see me tonight and, uh, and I know what the tickets were priced, and I appreciate you spending your money and your time here to see me. Is there something you came hoping to hear that I haven't played yet so I can play it for you? Wow. Um, and the fact that, uh, you know, here's, here's a guy whose career uh, started in the pub rock days in England in, in the early 70s when he was with Brinsley Schwartz. Here he is 40-plus years later, um, but still feels that commitment to his audience. Like, you want a certain experience from me. And I'm going to give it to you. Just tell me what it is. And I I thought that was really wonderful, and I found it quite inspiring. Yeah, it actually just kind of affected me just now, actually. I was like, wow, you know, that's something to really think about when you're on stage. Um, It's not just about 
you know, as a performer, especially as a stand-up, sometimes you can get so caught up in what you're trying to do and what your intention of the performance is. And uh, you forget that there is a deal that's happening there where they paid some money to to see you. And you have a certain – there's a certain responsibility there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I feel that way. Um, for example, if, if I'm watching like a long-form improvisational comedy show where they're doing a form, like they're uh, trying to do uh, like the Herald or the Armando, which is, has a certain form to it, and you see how the players are getting lost in this form. Like, okay, here we're going to do three scenes like this, and then this beat must call back to that, and they're all lost in their heads. And in those moments, it, it's like, you know, I just paid to see a comedy show. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't need whatever that overly complicated thing is that's hanging you guys all up. Like, you know, you can just forget that and make us laugh and we're all going to be OK. With yeah, the transaction tonight. <laughs> and um, I try to convey that to my guys about wrestling as well. That goes back to what we said before. Like the form is for you, the player, the performer, and the show is for the audience. Yeah, like, I paid for a comedy show like I didn't I didn't pay to see this really rigid structure adhered to. And I'm not going to get up with my whistle and be like, oh, that's from an Armando. Not a Harold. Start again, team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like... <laughs> and, and, and plus, comedy is supposed to be this rebellious kind of freeform thing. And now you're attributing a bunch of rules to it, and everyone's thinking about that. It's kind of – it can be screwed up. But right. I, want... I admire the challenge of that. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, sometimes you do have to kind of – and that's why I refer back to that, that evening with Nick Lowe sometimes. It's like uh... – I do, you do have to take that step back because I might have ambitions for my performance art and what I believe about professional wrestling and the type of storytelling that fictional sphere gives me access to that we've only scratched the surface of. Like, we can dive so deep into this if we're just willing to try. Yeah. But especially in the last two years, like, uh, there has to – I've really come to appreciate this. Like, uh, that's great, and there are times to take those risks and to indulge. However, there is also this uh, a wonderful fan base of people that have rallied around us, a global fan base, and maybe uh, some of them are intrigued to, to do this, but not all of them. And we have just an equal obligation to the others as we do to this group. You know, <laughs> yeah. um, they, They're all coming to the table looking for something, and ultimately we must find a way to service that consumer base or they probably aren't going to keep supporting us. Yeah, it's very – I mean – it's tough, and especially in the wrestling business. I mean, though, a wrestling fan is a pretty unique type of fan, I would say. Mm-hmm. Uh, they demand a lot of you guys, and uh, I think uh, Chikara gives it to them, especially since nowadays you guys do. I mean, Chikara is a full-time, pretty much. You have Twitter going, you have a Facebook, ebooks, an app people can get. The Ashes of Chikara, which are on YouTube, it's a full time um i don't know if, if a fan wants to devour as much chikara as they want I, it's pretty much there for them to devour right mm-hmm. and uh that's that's a 21st century um experience that you're giving them is that the kind of thing you're thinking about like because I, I heard you say in another podcast and i thought it was really wise it was uh, you said that we can't be looking to we should definitely be taking advice from the past, but we can't take arcane and old-fashioned ideas and apply them to today. Mm-hmm. And um, and I and I think you guys use technology to your advantage so well. Um, like, what are your thoughts on that in, in, in today's fan? Yeah, uh, th- that's certainly my mindset. I uh, I am ca- I, um, fearful at times of those that are beholden to the outdated rhetoric. Um, you know these. Well, th- you know this is the way that. Uh, you know, when we drew 15,000 people to the Alamo Dome in 1979, we did it this way. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's not to say there aren't, as, as you uh, very nicely there summarized, um, that's not to say there aren't lessons to be learned uh, from, from looking backward, um, advice to be taken. But we do not need to be blindly beholden to all those things in 2014 yeah. because uh, the challenges are very different. The demands of the audience are very different. And uh, we have a world of resources that the people that filled the Alamo Dome in 1979 or whatever that example might be could not have imagined at our disposal. No one could have imagined the way the Internet and everything that has come with it will will change all forms of entertainment. The deliver the people's expectations for the way they want their media and the way they want it delivered and all that has all changed really, really radically. Really um, fast in a really quick amount of time too. I would say I think people, people now demand they, 
I, they demand access when the show's not going on. You know? mm-hmm. Right. And I, uh, when I think about those things which really captured my imagination and made me feel like this, I want to devour as much of this thing, whether it was when I first fell in love with comic books or when uh, pro wrestling first captured my imagination or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. I want to devour as much of this as possible. More comic books are coming on Wednesday. I'll yeah. be at the comic store on Wednesday then, you know? Yeah. Uh, or oh, there, are there are magazines about what's going on in wrestling. I better start buying them all right now. <laughs> exactly. Um, like I had this insatiable appetite to devour and consume that type of stuff. And uh, it, you, you must be equal, equal to that. Oh yeah. Um, as a, as a, well, you know, in a sense, we are creating multimedia. So uh, if we have fans that demand that they they want that, like I better be able to service that to some extent, or they're just going to go somewhere else to satisfy their appetite. Because at least in the world of wrestling, people have tons of options. Mm-hmm. Um, if you don't particularly like the flavor of ice cream, that is to say, the exact type of wrestling that I make, uh, you know, there's another. Tri- you could sample somebody else's. There's the WWE is on television, what, they create 9 to 12 hours of original programming every single week that you can consume for free. All you yeah. do is turn your TV on. You don't need the network app. You don't need any of that to get their stuff. Um, it's more accessible. It's certainly made on millions of dollars of production value <laughs> and all those types of things. But uh, it, if I go into Baskin-Robbins and my favorite flavor of ice cream isn't in the barrel, you know, I look in that – frosty case and like oh man the one i like isn't there i'm probably not just going to get my car and drive back home like well then i'll have this flavor instead um i want to make sure that we're always in stock yeah you know you need a little bit more chikara don't worry there's more to, yeah here's today and tomorrow come back and i'll have another mouthful for you you know whatever yeah. that might be and you can go follow all our guys on Twitter, uh, you know, all the Chicago guys on Twitter, and there's they're coming up with stuff. And I think Twitter is one of the best things that happened to all of wrestling because it is so fun to watch two guys beef over Twitter and shoot on each other over Twitter. And mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's just it adds it gives you something during the week, waiting for the weekend, and um, it's a lot of fun. And I just got to say, it um, registers with me so much when you talk about the old. Um, you know, what should you take from the old days and what lessons should, should you apply to 2014 and what lessons aren't applicable to 2014? Because comedy, especially in Boston is, is so much like that. I mean, there's a ton of guys here who, uh, you know, were big in the 1980s and, um, they're still doing well, but they, they have rules that don't really apply anymore, Mm -hmm. uh, for us. And, and they, they're kind of worried and about the internet and, and things like that. And there's times where you gotta, you gotta decide what advice you should be taking and what advice you shouldn't be taking. And it's, it's just like an interesting, the world's, the world of wrestling and comedy are always crossing over. But if you look back at an old, if you look back at a comedy show from the 1950s, um, it would seem corny to the average person nowadays. You know what? It was killing back then. It was hilarious stuff. But nowadays it would seem so, you know, take my wife, please. You know, it seems so like, jokey to people that they wouldn't that they would detach from it now it's more of a personal um approach even a guy like seinfeld i think who was so big in the 80s and 90s he would have a a harder time coming out now um because people want a little bit um they want rawness they want a little bit of uh storytelling um because i've always been sort of a joke writer and then over the past few years i've started to put in more personal stories from my life not necessarily out of um, – because I just felt the need to tell those stories, more so because I was like, this is the direction I feel like stand-up comedy is going a little bit. People want a little bit of this. I'm going, I'm going to try out this sort of method, and I think wrestling's very similar in that way. Mm-hmm. I think they're always a product of their times. Yeah. Uh, you know, like you said, like you watch uh, maybe footage uh, of a comedian from the 1950s who's killing it, and you think this stuff would never play today. Of course not, nor would it have to. Yeah. You know, like uh, that guy was extremely successful in his era. And it, if he can still fill a room today, if there was somebody that was active in the 1950s and here we are, you know, whatever, 60 years later, and he's still filling a room, uh, that's remarkable to me. Like, yeah. That's beyond commendable. Uh, but like with Seinfeld or, or somebody like that who's really a product of his times, like to me, Seinfeld, that is the, ni- the 1990s. That's the yeah. comedy of the 1990s is Seinfeld. Mm-hmm. Um I go because I'd like to go back and revisit that for a bit. And yeah. I don't know that I would want to hear Seinfeld doing something that's – like I don't want to hear 
Seinfeld's Louis C.K. impression. You know what I mean? Like, exactly, yeah. I, I go because I, I want to go back and, and revisit that sort of thing. Um, a lot of times I'll feel that way about a musical artist who, uh, like, uh, for example, I'm a huge fan of David Byrne. So sometimes when I go to see him, I'm like, oh, man, I'd really like to hear a couple Talking Heads songs because I'd like to go – I'd like to be able to experience that. I wasn't a fan when the Talking Heads were together, and the only way I could ever hear one of those songs being played live is if David Byrne tonight chooses to do that. But there are nights where David Byrne just wants to play his latest album, and that's all. And that isn't exactly the experience that I wanted from him. Yeah. You know, in the same way, like, if I went to see Seinfeld, like, give me some of that – exactly Seinfeldian 1990s humor in the same way that like the people that probably go to see if there's a working comic from the 50s like I want to be reminded of the things that made me laugh then it made me feel a certain way then and if I can revisit that through you as a performer I'm more than willing to pay you for that experience and I do get why that can be frustrating to some people uh, like I'll, I'll take this to the wrestling side of things where you have a guy who you think this guy is years past his prime. And I want to say, I don't have somebody in mind as I'm saying this, but uh, no doubt we could probably think of somebody easily. Um, there's a guy years past his prime. Why does anyone keep booking him? Why is anyone giving him ring time? I can't believe people came to see him. I can't believe people stood in line to get his autograph <laughs> at intermission. Clearly, whether you understand why this guy was maybe a product of the 1980s, is still relevant today. That might elude you, but that doesn't mean it, it eludes everybody. Yeah, um, and uh, that's true. That's that's true across all performance art. I think uh, the, uh, you're a product of your times. I agree. Do you think any uh, pro wrestling promoters are as passionate about art as you are? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I not all that long ago I had this idea, maybe <laughs> to explore that. I thought. Could I put on something like I don't I don't think I really fully understand what a symposium is, but could I put something on where I ask the people who I think would speak openly about their philosophy about wrestling as an art form, and we all came together, whether we recorded it or broadcast it was almost irrelevant. But could we could I get a bunch of these people together in a room and really have like an open discussion, not because there's certainly a mindset among some in wrestling. I know some secret information, and I'm not going to give it to you. Oh, yeah. Or you'll use it to get ahead of me. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't want to play with you. Like, stay home in your yeah. cave. Whatever. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't care. Um, but the people that would talk about it openly, and, and then I wondered, would that interest anyone other than me? Like, if I put out the invitation, that's what I, I show think. up, and I'm like, is it just me here? <laughs> it probably would be, because even the thought of trying to, like, better wrestling as a group would probably be something only you would really, <laughs> like, think. Other people would be like, uh, what? Uh, no, it's, everything's fine, so right. goodbye. <laughs> Everything is great. <laughs> maybe it's just because I'm like, where's the money? Uh, you know? Like, let's all get better, and, and maybe we'll see some money. And everyone else is like, oh, we got the money. That's the thing. We've got it. We're not giving it to you. I don't know. I did, I um, I'll tell you this uh, with a, a little chagrin. Um, I was having a meeting once during my the annual time when the uh, Chikara's accountant must do the corporate taxes. <laughs> and we, ha we frequently have a conversation that goes like this. He, uh, he takes his glasses down his nose and looks over the tops of the frames at me. And he goes, we're not doing this for another year, are we? <laughs> and... Um, so he wanted to have a very serious discussion with me about, like, what's your three-year plan? What's your five-year plan? Where do you see this going? Like, is there a certain mark that if you miss it, you're going to say, we're done? Um, he wanted to have that type of conversation, which I'm always ill-equipped to have. <laughs> and um, somehow the conversation ended up with, not unlike what you were asking me, saying, uh, what do you think it would take for you to just get a few minutes of Vince McMahon's time to discuss some of your philosophy about where you see wrestling going with the guy who is the dominant player. Like, would he be generous enough with his time to just spend a few minutes on a call with you because he would bring a perspective that might inform you uh, and the direction that you go? And I thought, you know, that's not the dumbest idea I've ever heard. No. Like, so uh, I left the meeting and I called. Uh, and I, I knew somebody a couple rungs beneath him. And yeah. I said, I know this is really out of the blue and uh, – most likely, this my name means nothing in that office whatsoever. Do you think you could just get me on the phone with him for a couple minutes? I'd like to talk to him. 
and uh, this this went absolutely nowhere. I mean, in no way, shape, or form are they going to allow me to speak to, to Vince McMahon on the phone. They're like, right. you're crazy. Like, you want to talk to him about the state of wrestling? Where do you think it's going? <laughs> Is that right? And I'm sorry. What's your name again, little person? Like, it was so This is a billion-dollar traded, uh, publicly traded corporation. <laughs> So so when it was all over, don't get me wrong, it stung a little bit. I was like, geez, you know, like uh, as I was talking myself up in the mirror, that went a lot better than I – Yeah. Than it really went there on the phone, but uh... – yeah, You've got a few uh, ex-students working over there. You think somebody would be able to pull them aside. Well, well but... a lot has changed. This was a couple of years ago. This was a couple yeah. Of years ago, but, uh, but yeah, a lot has changed. And... I think that's really cool though that you even – you know, so many people – and if anyone's listening, make that kind of call though anyway. Even if it goes nowhere, the fact that you even – Walked out of your accountant's office and I'm like, fuck it, I'm going to call Vince McMahon. A lot of people wouldn't have even made it that far. You know, they would have gone, no, oh, he'll never, uh, he'll never answer and it's just a waste and blah, blah, blah. It's like you have to take little chances. You have to try. You have to be bold in, in business or any type of business, but especially in show business, I think. Mm-hmm. Right, because uh, for me, I, you know, I was kind of, uh, I think about, I had a job as a telemarketer for several years. And uh, the, the guy who was my manager at the job used to say, if one out of every 20 calls turns into a sale for you and your sales goal for the day is to make 10 sales, then you know you need to make 200 phone calls before you go home, right? Because that's the number. Yeah. That's the number. A certain number. If you know it's, you know, whatever it is, one in 10 and you need so uh, – and I always kind of think about it in, in that way. Like if I make enough of those types of phone calls, somebody's going to take my call. Yeah, absolutely. Like, some, somebody is, is going to answer. Um, <laughs> maybe that's not the best way to spend an afternoon, but there are there are far worse ways for me to spend an afternoon. Because every once and again, you are genuinely surprised by that uh, that sort of thing. And w- you know, this movie that we recently made, The Ashes of Chikara. And I say when I say recently, I mean we've been making forever. I um, loved it, by the way. That was I thought that was so. Uh, I spent a lot of time talking to Jervis about how cool I thought that was. Oh well, thank you. I'm yeah. glad that was such a labor of love. And getting some of the musical artists involved, um, you know, uh, I, I ended up initiating tons of conversations with wonderful musical artists. And a lot of them, for any number of reasons, the legality and the royalties and the paperwork and the red tape and the blah, 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 couldn't happen. They couldn't be involved. But you make enough of those, and eventually somebody's like, that sounds like a really cool idea, and we're in. Yeah. Um, and and th- that's like magic. It's like to the me, podcast is magic. like that, too. Podcast is like that, too. At first, no one wants to be on it, and then after a while, start getting, you know, people see what you're doing, and they're like, hey, you know what? Maybe I will do that. You know, it seems kind of cool. Mm-hmm. But I, I really thought – I think, actually, it kind of this kind of leads into my next question um, about – the WWE and Vince because I thought when I was watching the Ashes of Chikara I was like this is so awesome this is such a good freaking idea this is such a great way to tell the stories of these wrestlers and I was like and it's gonna get stolen by the WWE <laughs> I was like because <laughs> I was just like I could see them doing this with their guys and almost, like you know what I mean I just mm-hmm. was like this is such a great idea how can it not be stolen by every wrestling promotion out there do you, do you are you ever afraid of stuff like that because you know with with the WWE being so big and having probably I'm talking out of my ass, but probably a thousand, <laughs> three hundred lawyers or something like that, and <laughs> all the money behind them and everything. Like, are you ever worried that they could just take something from you, and there's really nothing you could do about it? Um, I think I think so. I think that's a reality. Um, uh, I'll, I'll tell you a, a kind of related story about when I had to learn to get over that. Uh, many many years ago, I was asked by an assistant editor at DC Comics to send in a submission of three story samples uh, mm-hmm. when I, I wanted very, very much to write for them. And I observed then, uh, within the same calendar year, one of the submissions I had sent to them being oh. printed just with rewritten dialogue Ugh. in the back of another book. And I reached out to the assistant editor, and uh, I said to him, I am 99% certain this is just the plot that I submitted to you with the dialogue rewritten. Uh-huh. And uh, his response to me was, you understand that you don't own Batman and Green Lantern. This is our intellectual property. And once you submit that to us, it's ours. If we decide uh-huh. to do something else or I take this plot and give it to a writer to rewrite part of it or something, like that's entirely our prerogative to do. And that stung really hard for me. That's uh, tough. But legally, 
he's in the right. Yeah. I don't own Batman. I can't claim any dominion over a Green Lantern story. Like, uh, that's that's no different than anyone who aspires, like, as a fan fiction type writer. Yeah. Um, so, uh, that coupled with the fact that because now we uh, we do have a lot of friends, uh, mutual friends at the WWE, um, it can be very satisfying when I hear back from them, like, you know, they just watched this video of yours in the writer's room, and you're going to see something very, very similar in the next seven days done here. And just so you know, we're taking it right from you. <sighs> like, um, at least there, at least there's no. No, we didn't. You know, yeah. Uh, like, I, well, I we like just happen fact, to think that. Yeah, yeah. Right. We're like, uh, they really love this thing, and they want to do something exactly like that. And you know, we just wanted you to know, like, uh, we loved it. Um, like, great. Like, there's nothing else. You know, ideas can't be copywritten or things like that. Ideas are just out there, and I steal liberally from all the stuff that I love. Yeah. You know, I love this from this comic book, and I want to steal this and take part of it. And uh, this thing over here, I just love this, and I want to steal <laughs> it and play with this like a, pl- a, a bl- bit of Play-Doh and shape it a little bit different. Or um, taking things uh, that, that I love and finding a way that uh, we can uh, insert a little bit of our own narrative into it. Um, I, think, I think that's a, a, a wonderful thing, and I think that happens creatively all the time. Mm-hmm. I am amazed... Something like the Ashes of Chikara hasn't been attempted by a company that has that type of budget, because we sure don't. Yeah. That whole thing was made on a ham sandwich and a half-drunk can of Diet Coke. Um, <laughs> and it was only because we had such a resourceful group of tremendously talented people that were willing to sacrifice and to see it through to its conclusion – um, that that it finally came out, and there was at least one discussion where um, the principal people behind it. This discussion was had that um, if we fail, we can't finish it, we can't deliver it on time. Uh, it never makes it to the to the big screen. We never do these things that we're that we're saying. the The worst possible outcome is not that um, oh you know. Uh, this particular project didn't get made. It's that a project like this will never be made by anyone. No one will ever try. And you could say, wow, you know, that that movie, The Ashes of Chikara, sure would have been a lot better if they had $5 million to make it with instead of the ham sandwich. Like, that's that's not the... The project is what it is, right? Like, that's not the downfall of it. The, the real downfall would just be that this concept never gets its due. Yeah. That it's never attempted whatsoever. And that goes back to the things we said at the very beginning of this conversation. We will walk right out to center stage with the spotlight on us and plant on our faces and fail miserably. Um, But it must be attempted. Someone must try. This is worthy of being experimented with. And even if somebody who does have millions or billions of dollars at their disposal ultimately says, and now we're going to do it, so be it. I'm I'm powerless to stop you from trying. Yeah. Um, You know, uh, but – I don't know. I, it's kind of tough. Uh, it's a tough one because it's imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. But when they're the billionaires and you're the one trying to get your product out, it can be it can sting. I've I've had stuff stolen as a comedian too, and I had a I had a script get made. Pretty much, me and a friend of mine wrote a script. Uh, I can't even really talk about what movie it was, but it basically got they took our basic plot and switched a few minor things around. Had another guy. Write it, rewrite it and they released it as a movie and it was uh. it was just like oh my me and my friend were calling each other we both went to see different movies and we saw the trailer and we t- called each other on the same day and we we're just like our movie idea was totally stolen by Sony uh. <laughs> we said it was just like your story we were young guys we sent it into Sony because mm-hmm. um, he had representation there and uh, they were like hey uh, we like this idea but why, not, why don't you go work on it a little bit more and bring it back to us and then by that time it was already being worked on by other guys it could Mm. be tough well how about this what if in a hypothetical world since this is the hypothetically podcast if you could steal one thing from the wwe a talent an idea uh anything and you get a total free pass what would it be (laughs) man i I should start making a laundry list Uh, (laughs) so uh they um they are monolithic. Um, you know, they they are playing the game at such a level. They're not even playing the same game I am anymore. To be fair, um, 
uh, perhaps for reasons of sentimentality, if I thought I could steal back that Cesaro fellow, <laughs> uh, I really do think the the world of him. And uh, he is a good guy. <laughs> yeah, that, that guy knows what he's doing. Um, I think about this. You know, I'm no longer actively wrestling. My last match was just about a year ago. And um, oh my I, god, is that is that for real? Your last match, or I mean... uh, certainly the way I feel these days oh, it is, yeah. and I feel like. Um, Especially in the in the last two years or so, the uh, the miles I've put on this car have caught up to me. <laughs> um, I really feel that. But the thing I can say uh, about Cesaro, and I have been so wonderfully fortunate to share the ring with all, virtually all my wrestling heroes, um, and uh, with tons of other tremendous talents. Uh, I don't know that I've ever enjoyed the type of in ring chemistry I have with another performer that I had with. Cesaro. And uh, when he left, um, uh, in some small way, I think a little bit of my passion for the craft went with him. Wow. Because uh, I, I don't know, and, and, and maybe this is me being, uh, maybe I'm being too complacent or I've I've um, I've lost a, a willingness to challenge myself as I felt the physical injuries slowing me down. Mm -hmm. I feel like I don't know that I will enjoy that type of in-ring chemistry against somebody again that I had with that man. And uh. he challenged me in a way. Um, he forced me to uh, up my game uh, to where I thought I was playing. At my maximum level, or uh, I love to steal this phrase uh, from, from comedians, playing at the top of my intelligence. <laughs> yeah. and, and he would look down at me and be like, no, you can come up a little bit more. Let's go. Come on. Uh, a little bit more out of you. I know you have it in you, and I know, I know maybe somebody else isn't going to draw it out of you, but I will. And uh, I sincerely miss that about my friend. Oh, that is really cool. Are you guys still friendly these days? Uh, yes. Uh, so I, I do love to kind of touch base with him and and see where his travels have taken him and everything else. And um, also trying to uh, keep him grounded as, <laughs> as, as his ascension continues. Yeah, it must be, um, must be tough to stay grounded when, when you're going through that stuff. Also, Cesaro, for the, for the listener out there, trained at the Wrestle Factory, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. He moved from Switzerland to Pennsylvania to train with us, and uh, he did so for many, many years. And even though uh, I always like to put this disclaimer out there, if, if maybe all you know about his training is what you glean from his Wikipedia page, um, mm -hmm. that man trained with lots of different people, yeah. and he would have been a superstar regardless of who he trained with. But I take great pride in knowing he spent more hours in the ring with me than with any other person yeah. in his wrestling career. And um, I'm not only proud of that fact, but I, I feel very fortunate as well. Yeah, I, I think that's something to be proud of. And if anyone's out there is looking for great training and you want to be a great wrestler like Cesaro, you should check out the Wrestle Factory. Um, well, thanks for doing that plug for me. <laughs> no problem, in. buddy. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say... Um, I got some questions here from the fans. Um, Let's ignore them all. Yeah, you know, it's, we're, we're at an hour. Let's get to some of these fan questions. You're, <laughs> you're definitely one of the most famous people I've ever had on the show. People, when I, when I said I was interviewing you, people, like, uh, I could see their jealousy in their eyes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I know a few of your wrestlers, and I could see their... I could see a little fear in their eyes, like, mm. oh, God, uh, like, what, what's going to happen? And uh, so I, I had questions for you myself, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use my fan question first because it's my podcast, mm. and, I get, and I get to do that. I was going to ask you, I know you have a lot of, um, you have a lot of great wrestlers on your roster. You can't play favorites, but I'm going to ask you, who, who are some of your favorites? <laughs> 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 um, I've had to recently, I made a list of the, of the roster, uh, the complete roster going back to the earliest days. So even the, the gen one guys that aren't with us anymore, like back in the early days, there was Mr. Zero, a guy who's entered into semi-retirement many, many moons ago, all the way up to the most current and recent, uh, debut, a debutante, would that be the right word? People that debuted, right? That's a... Debutante. I, I guess so, sure. That's, that's something about saying that doesn't sound right to me. But I, think I thought a debutante right was like a southern uh, – but he, 
a southern lady, but then they, they guess they make their debut eventually, so that's how they get the name. I don't know. I think that is what the word means, but it does seem weird assigning that to a wrestler. Um, That'd be a great – by the way, that could be a good character for season 13, <laughs> the debutantes. Or a, a female wrestler named Deb U. Taunts. Mm, How about that? I, I like where that's headed. <laughs> Consider that stolen. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I'll just I, tell people I write for the Wrestle Factory. You know, <laughs> I, I've I would have been a writer anywhere, but I've spent most of my time writing there. <laughs> Um, so I made this comprehensive list of everyone, and I was doing it for this reason. Um, uh, I wanted to try and delineate what it was that made each of these performers unique. And what n was never an issue was coming up with what the strength of every single performer was. And they, were, they weren't all the same. You know, th this person might be very good at this particular thing, and this person who they trained with and physically maybe even resemble them was different at a completely different set of things. And I walked away from that experience with um, a real appreciation for the fact that everybody brings something different, and it's all these ingredients together that make the Chikara flavor of ice cream as delicious as it is. If we were all cut from the exact same cloth, there mm. would be a homogenized quality to it. It would almost, there'd be like a monotony to it. And sometimes when I hear people who are critical of the Performance Center down in Orlando that the WWE runs, it's that they are homogenizing the talent. That you might come with this particular thing and this person over here comes with a very different thing, but by the time you're done with the process, we've made you all into the exact same type of wrestler. Mm. Um, and so especially now, it'd be very hard for me to play favorites because I feel like I just spent quite a, quite a good, good bit of time realizing how incredibly talented and diverse everybody that's ever worked for me um, over the years and everybody I've ever trained and even, right. you know, not, not, not everybody at Chikara has been trained at the wrestle factory. I'd like to point out. So we have wonderful people that come from the outside as well. Um, what a diverse array of talents. And yeah. so, um, somebody like, uh, a hollow wicked might bring a very different skill set from a Jervis Cottonbelly, Who's very, very different from an Eddie Kingston, right. uh, who's very different from an Archibald Peck. And yet they're all wonderful, wonderful performers. And, and uh, actually, you know, the Ashes of Chikar is a great way for people to sort of get a little look at all those guys and kind of that's I think that's one of the things that makes it interesting. The Ashes is because it's like you have you have Eddie Kingston in one scene and you have, uh, you know, uh, Green Ant in another scene. You know what I mean? And it's like well, it, it's just such a cool universe. I'm, I'm And I'm going to talk about that before on the intro for the podcast and stuff. But I just really can't like stress that enough to people. It's it's just if you're a comic book fan, that's a great analogy. It's like getting into a new comic book that you can actually go see, touch, shake hands, take pictures with. But even if you're a f person who's just into something, I don't know, people follow serials so closely now, like Breaking Bad and um, – mm -hmm binge watching television and it's all about the storyline a lot of shows like the walking dead it's like uh, you know it's a soap opera with zombies mixed in people want to people tune in for the story more than the action now and it's like uh you get you're gonna get that with Chikar, and i really hope people who are listening will give it a chance just just throwing that out there well, thank you <laughs> um and also i uh i had a question from a fan uh, at Jen Keys 3, uh, she mm -hmm. noticed that there were many Watchmen references on season 12. Mm -hmm. Do you have any direct ties to the Watchmen? Uh, the ties are all indirect. Um, so <laughs> something that gets brought up a lot is that um, – uh, and I, I appreciate this about the subjectivity of storytelling, and I never want to violate that for our audience. So if you, in watching the events of season 11, 12, and 13 – felt like there is a clear allegory here that Icarus is Rorschach from Watchmen. I want you to know that what you've discovered is entirely valid because uh, I want the audience to be able to find those connections, yeah. and I never want to contradict them. Um, I extremely dislike the experience of a song means something to me, and then I hear the artist explain, no, this song is not about that at all, but about this. Yeah. Um, it would be like, um, for example, if you've ever heard Sting talk about the police song, Every Breath You Take, he describes it as being a song about stalking someone. But I also know people that have used that as their wedding song. Oh, of course, yeah. So uh, I don't know that it's really my place on someone's wedding day to go up to them and be like, you know that song that must have a very deep-rooted sentimental uh, – 
connotation to you, you know that's invalid, right? What you feel is invalid? <laughs> yeah. Like, absolutely not. I, I think that's yeah. reprehensible. Um, so, uh, it's like a painting. You can't, you can't, two people will look at the Sistine Chapel and have two different emotional reactions to it, you know? Right. And those are both valid. They deserve to be honored. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, to Jen or anyone else out there that feels like uh, I see these kind of ties, I want you to know I w we will always do our best to honor honor those interpretations. Um, I've been asked though, like, are there secret hidden things? If I went back and read Alan Moore's Watchmen graphic novel, that are then they play out or they're explained or heightened or explored. Um, those things are all very, very indirect. What I liked about Watchmen, which um, uh, what, what I wanted to take from Watchmen, you know, in that continuing idea, like I just steal from uh, this particular <laughs> thing. What I really wanted to steal from Watchmen is that story gives me a feeling of dread. Yeah. And uh, because we love to foreshadow things at Chikara, that's just part of our weird storytelling habits, um, in order to start to prepare our audience for something quite dreadful that did happen at Anniversario Never Compromise when they watched the company implode, um, that was very, very deliberately borrowed because Watchmen gives you a sense of dread. And I think even before people realized it, just all those illusions – all, all those very clear-cut references to Watchmen, it began to heighten your sense of dread whether you realized it or not. And so uh, that doesn't mean if you read page 48 of Watchmen, you'd be like, this is exactly what happened at you know, uh, <laughs> this particular event. Um, I, I, I want you to know that the direct efforts weren't made to do that, that type of thing. And that, but that is not to say that you couldn't start to find those things if you dug deep enough. And those, those are all worthy. They're all valid. Are fans often finding things you didn't even realize you did? And you're just like, oh, my God, that is true. <laughs> Every once and again, we do get a happy coincidence because our fans, they are tuned into the details. They do look at things like subtext, like what is between the lines here? And it's wonderful. It's, I mean, it's just serendipity, but it's yeah. wonderful when they find something and I, I, I get a big grin on my cranky face. When <laughs> somebody's like, uh, do you think this is just a coincidence that this happened? And we're all like, wow, what a crazy coincidence. But some other fan will come in and say, there are no coincidences at Chikara. Yeah. You, you know they planned this thing years in advance. Like, I think that's wonderful because, you know, there are those times when that's true, but every once and again, you, you just can't you can't yeah. account for every pick a yoon little thing like that. Yeah. And it's wonderful that they put that faith in us. Like, you know, there's no such thing as coincidence at Chikara. I, I, I get a, a tremendous sense of joy when I see something like that from our fans. Well, and I think that shows that you're giving people good stuff and you're giving people such smart, good stuff that they're finding it even when it's not there. <laughs> you know what I mean? They, yes. they just expect, they expect such like an intelligent product that they're, that they're like, they're seeking it out and finding it. Right. Uh, that validates I, this. Uh, when I've been called upon to uh, – somebody might say, for example, something like this. Someone from a, a bigger wrestling company than Chikara says, if we were going to bring you on to help craft a story, give us an example of what you might do with these characters from our universe. What might you do? And then I make them a pitch. And I tell him, I think I might do this or I might do that. And then the story would go like this and then this would happen and I would do this, blah, blah, blah. I give him the whole pitch. And when it's over, I hear a response like this. Uh, that is not what wrestling fans want from their <laughs> professional wrestling. And uh, I always think, but that is what I want. Yeah. And I am a wrestling fan. And there are more people just like me that do want this from wrestling. And I am responsible to make that for them because – You've just told me bold, boldly that you won't make it. Like, no, that we don't make that type of wrestling here. Or, yeah. no, we don't want to tell that type of story. Or, no, we understand the entire world at large, and they don't want what you make. Like, yeah. like I'm always the, I'm like that tiny little guy shaking his fist at the sky like, no, that's exactly what I want, and I will make it. <laughs> well, this kind of um... – that kind of leads perfectly into the next question, which is from at Colts Roomba. <laughs> Col Cabana's Roomba has its own Twitter account. Oh, thank goodness. Um, <laughs> how long does it take to plot out a season of Chikara? Is it pitched to the wrestlers? Is everyone aware of the big... Oh, how is it pitched to the wrestlers? And is everyone aware of the big picture? Um, a long time. No. <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> um, so, it's, so just, you... it's just not 
it's not smart. It's not possible. Um, it wouldn't be responsible, um, especially when you do things that uh, require preserving the mystique at all costs. And you have an organization where there are constantly new people coming in. Yeah. Whether they're coming in as performers, they're coming in as support staff or crew or whatever. And uh, you can't trust the person that just came on the crew the same way you trust the guy that's been with you for 12 and a half years. You just – Of course, you, yeah. You can't do that. And sometimes it is not entirely clear who is trustworthy. Um, so generally speaking, the cards are kept pretty close to the vest. I like that. I like to hear that. And, you know, it's it, – I don't know how – I don't know. I know a few wrestlers, but if they're anything like comedians, they're not great at keeping secrets anyway. So it's probably better to just <laughs> – Right. Keep it inside. Keep it close to the vest. There's an old adage that uh, dates back to the uh, the, f the first WrestleMania boom in the mid '80s, and when I reference the technology, you'll understand why. <laughs> they said, uh, "There's only three ways to spread a story around: telephone, telefax, or telewrestler." <laughs> I like so. that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. Um, all right. Well, I think I have one more question for you from a fan, and I think well, you that kind of... one I will not answer. <laughs> no, I'm actually, sorry, fan. That's the thing. I think you kind of already answered it, but I guess you can give a different answer because you have had many. You've had many Chikara alumni uh, go on to great things. Uh, mm -hmm. A small list would be CM Punk, Cole Cabana, Daniel. Da I almost said Danielle Bryan, but Daniel Bryan, mm -hmm. the debutante so, Daniel, <laughs> debutante Bryan Danielson, reality television star, mm. uh, Cesaro, Sami Zayn, otherwise known as El Generico, and uh, Chris Hero, mm -hmm. and also Jay Lethal, Adam Cole, and the list goes on and on. You, and you still have a great roster right now. So the question from Darnell Mitchell was. Of all the former Chikara guys in the whole WWE or beyond, who's your favorite? I know you can't pick a favorite, and I know you said all that great stuff about Cesaro, but I think I think all Darnell wants to know is, you know, what do you think of these guys going on to bigger and better things, and and uh, or not necessarily better, but bigger things, and uh, you know, like what does that feel like? Because I know as a comedian. It's, it can be a little bittersweet sometimes when you have a friend who goes on to Comedy Central or gets, you know, I've had friends who some of them do it longer than others and some of them, I mean, that list of guys is all pretty amazing, but, uh, you know, it can be like bittersweet when someone leaves your crew and goes off to another crew. Like, is there... Right, yeah, I think that's a very valid feeling, um, that, that, that bittersweet feeling that you put it very, very well, I think, um... And it can be tough. I think any performer at times you're going to wrestle with uh, jealousy. You know, you feel like, I wish I had that opportunity that somebody else had or whatever. Um, uh, why, you know, why wasn't it, why wasn't it me? Um, yeah. You know, I'm just as funny or I'm just as talented um, or I, I know I'm funnier than this guy. I work harder than this guy. I was out there. I did every open mic. Well, this guy was at home asleep or, you know, what, whatever exactly. that thing might yeah. be. And sometimes opportunity is a fickle mistress. Um, you know, fickle debutantes, right? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, m maybe, uh, m m maybe I tell this to myself as the salve I put on the wounds of failure. I don't know, but I feel like uh, everything happens for a reason, and uh, I'm in the exact place where I am for a reason. Um, if if I wanted to, if I wanted to see something like the Ashes of Chikara advance what our type of performance art is possible of doing then it's really good that maybe two, three years ago I was in a meeting where all my pitches were met with, you know, rolled eyes and yeah. shaking heads, and they said, nobody wants to see professional wrestling like that. They don't, well, you know, they want to forget by Monday what you just told them on Sunday night's pay-per-view. Yeah. Uh, this ongoing mythology with the hidden Easter eggs and the foreshadowing and the callbacks and the symbolism and all this other kind of stuff has no place in our business, kid. There's the door, and don't let the elevator clip you on the butt cheeks while you're on your way down. Um, wow. you so know, is that is that an actual is that an actual true story? Uh, uh, maybe not I the mean, part about the elevator and my butt cheeks. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but speak, uh, I, speaking in generalities, um, maybe a big promotion had you come in for a little consultation and they didn't like what you had to say. Right, and uh, I think maybe not just based on the fact of how those types of pitch meetings go, but. Uh, I'm in the exact place that I need to be to do what, I, what I'm supposed to do, and uh, I, I just can't get lost in the rest of it. The people that go on uh, – Cesaro is the most obvious example. We talked about him at length. Yeah. Um, I feel like uh, I, I can look at him 
And from the moment he landed on American soil with his, with his luggage and all the money he'd saved up at his Swiss job before he got here and everything else, uh, he had one goal. I'm going to make it to the WWE, and I'm going to craft myself into the exact type of performer that they will one day want to hire as a way to do that. And uh, he pursued that goal with a discipline and a dedication above and beyond anyone I've ever known. And uh, he's the example I point to. When, when I'm training other people, I can think of no more perfect example. Um, you can't come to me 10, 15, 20 years later crying and complaining, why didn't I get the opportunity that Claudio did? Well, if you can match that man in terms of his commitment and dedication to that ideal, you will. Yeah. And if you're not willing to work at least that hard, then I'm not go- I won't be the one drying your tears when it doesn't come true. And you know what? I think as a comedian, it's the same. And as uh, that was one of my rudest awakenings as um, f- you know, going from like kind of an open mic comic into becoming a real comedian was I just realized how much real hard work the good comedians do and the guys who are the best in the top of their game it's not because they're it's not an accident you know they make it look easy but it's 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 a lot of people forget in 2014 you just got to do the work and if you really are passionate and work hard about on something you can be the best mm-hmm. do you think um you said uh, earlier about cesaro like he probably would have made it no matter what he just had that certain something that it factor yeah. do you feel that way sometimes like did you do you think there's a – because I know with comedy, sometimes I'll just meet a guy and I'll be like, I don't know, but I bet that guy's going to be famous one day. He just has that certain something. Mm-hmm. Uh, did, you, did you ever feel that way about a wrestler that came through your school and turned out to be true? Or do you think some guys grow into it or what do you think? Um, I feel like it's part of my job as a trainer is to find that thing, uh, even if it's buried – um, I do see a lot of a, not a majority, but a lot of a lot of folks that come. Uh, and pro wrestling requires you, at least when you're when you're performing, to be an extrovert. And I get people that come into training; these are clear introverts. Yeah. <laughs> In the world <clears throat> removed from professional wrestling, they are introverts. And uh, for you to be a successful performer, even if you know just out there doing two minute matches, that's not going to work. And I know you've something inside of you has pulled you to this pursuit, and it's my job to challenge you in ways that will draw it out. And you might hate me because I do it. You, you, might, you might dread coming to training with me because I'm going to find a way to, to do that sort of thing, and I'm going to make you – I'm going to challenge you to do this thing, and that makes me feel um, embarrassed. Or I, I would be uncomfortable doing that in a ring in front of a room full of strangers or whatever. Yeah. And, uh, that, well, <clears throat> those are the coals you must be raked over if your ultimate goal one day is to perform between the ropes. Yeah. Um, and um, I think that that's my recurring challenge now is – uh, I will find it in you, uh, That's even cool. if it doesn't present itself immediately. Because there there are people that just walk in, and you know what that's like. They just walk in, and you're like, that guy gets it. Yeah, like, he's yeah. playing on a whole different field than everybody else. Well, well, like like Cesaro, that guy would have been a star no matter where he ended up. Mm-hmm. You know, he could have been he could have spent the next five years toiling away at the Belgian Waffle Wrestling Federation, and he <laughs> still would have ended up on top of the world one day or another, you know, by hook, crook, or uh, whatever the end of that metaphor is. Oh, the BWFA but, is fantastic. Right? Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, I watch them on Netflix, um, <laughs> and I think the animation's beautiful. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so, <laughs> but uh, the real the real trick can be is somebody comes in who there. The, from the opposite end of the spectrum, not the that guy's going to be a star no matter what, but how is this person going to be a star? And that's where the process begins. There's something inside of you, and I've that's, got to find a way to draw it out. That's a really cool. Uh, that's I don't know what if you have a like a catchphrase for the Wrestle Factory, but the Wrestle Factory, I will find it in you. Right. <laughs> that's <a> very cool. <laughs> I will find the WWE superstar inside. I think that the uh, marketing campaign <laughs> should be a, a window at night, and I'm I'm peering in it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> every breath you take, right. every breath you take. Right, I'm getting kind of a creepy vibe, but I do <laughs> want to attend. Also, by the way, when you said Sting earlier, it's sad mm-hmm. that my first thought was of Sting the wrestler and right. not a member of the police. I was like, right. oh yeah, Sting, he's coming back. I hear. Uh, <laughs> Um, it's time for me to let you go. I'm so sorry. I have one more fan question, and I have to ask because I actually know this fan, and I'll, I'll be a oh. dick if I don't do it. It's a very quick one. Because uh, my friend who's a comedian, Pat Barrett, 
at Bat Parrot on Twitter. Uh, he wanted to know, because he's a comic, and we're always testing out new material, and we have to go sometimes to open mics and do it. Sometimes we squeeze it into, like, a paid gig. How do wrestlers test material? Like, how do you test a new, maybe a new move or maybe a new uh, angle you're trying to work? Like, where do you test stuff out for the small crowds? Uh, that's a great question, um, because... Probably, you know, if, if you practice your stand-up routine in your bathroom in front of your mirror or how, whatever your process might be, likewise, you know, uh, for example, at the Wrestle Factory, you might have a training match where you're pro- not performing in front of a live audience. Um, so you could, you could, you might have that, like something that's a physical mechanic. Like, I wonder yeah. if I could jump off the turnbuckle and do this. You know, that, that's the perfect right. kind of thing probably to experiment with at training. Whereas if you think, I wonder if I could do this and the audience would enjoy it or could I do this and get – I want to elicit this response. Will this this and this make that happen? Uh, certainly there are really high-pressure situations, probably analogous with what you described as like a paying gig. Like yeah. I got this corporate thing. I'm entertaining a bunch of bankers. I have a 15-minute set at a conference that I'm being paid ridiculous money for. I hey, should probably you're, play the greatest you're reading, hits. You're reading my schedule? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that kind of call, what I would call requires your greatest hits. Yeah. Like, I'm going to play the tried and true material that's going to get a laugh every single time out. Um, you know, it, maybe that speaks a little bit to the ritual as well. Like, if we go into a town where we haven't been in this town in two years, they've been dying for us to come back. Like, and these people are our, these are the fans that they've begged for us to come back. Like, they probably need to see a few of the greatest hits. They're here for the ritual. Right. Like, they want to experience that. Like, we must be Journey tonight, and we must play Don't Stop Believin'. It's not Deep Cuts Nut. It's not the night where, uh, hey, uh, you want to hear the new songs I've been working on? <laughs> no, Journey, <laughs> just play yeah. Don't Stop Believin'. Exactly. But there are those other low-pressure situations where every once and again, it's all, it's all right to make the decision, like, let's play one of the songs off the new album that nobody's heard yet. Yeah, that's cool. And plus, I mean, with Chikara, you, like, on those you know your fans are so like dedicated they'd probably be it's like it's like with comedy you're at a certain club if it's like a rock club and it's kind of a younger crowd you know they're going to be a little more forgiving to to you than say the saturday night comedy club crowd mm-hmm. well mr quackenbush thank you so much for uh you know giving your time to us today i'm sure my my listeners are going to absolutely love this interview and uh Personally, I'm looking forward to going. I'm going to be making the trip, driving six hours down to Pennsylvania on the 25th, and watching you guys. And I can't, you know, I can't wait. Fantastic. Well, yeah. I hope if um, I'm glad that you will be there, and if anybody else is coming, I'll, I'll very quickly summarize what you can expect. The Absolutely. Night, the night before, Saturday the 24th, we have a couple of events, and they are this: in the afternoon, we're doing a charitable fundraiser for the Make a Wish Foundation. Uh, where you can bowl with us, or if you prefer a little bit of friendly rivalry, bowl against us. And that whole bowling event, Lucha Bowl, is a fundraiser for the Make-A-Wish Foundation that we're participating in. Um, information about that's at chikarapro.com. Then afterward, we're going to adjourn back to the Palmer Center. That's the site of the event. They have a picnic grove there, and we're putting on a potluck cookout kind of thing. So uh, if you don't know what a potluck is, you're going to bring something. We'll, everybody else will bring something, and we're going to have a great old time out under the picnic pavilion. Uh, if classic rock isn't playing, I'll eat my hat, and uh, <laughs> we'll have a great old time in the late afternoon, early evening. And then from there, inside the Palmer Center is Wrestling is Fun. That's Chikara's sister organization. Um, and, and, and that's a, uh, a very kid-friendly effort yeah. that we'll be putting together. Then the following day, that's it, May 25th, that's Sunday afternoon, uh, the Expansion Pack Interactive Fan Event unfortunately is sold out, but there are a few tickets remaining for You Only Live Twice. That's the name of the uh, season premiere at Chikara. And as I said, you can either get tickets or stream it live via the Magic of Eye pay-per-view. Everything you need to know is at ChikaraPro.com. Uh, if you like what you heard today, hey, feel free to follow me at Mike Quackenbush or come out and support us because God knows we could use your dollars and we'd love to see your smiling face at the events. If you hated what we talked about, just shut up. <laughs> yeah, don't tweet about it. <laughs> yeah, don't be telling people that. Come on. And if anyone out there you know, is looking for – you know, there you can go to chikarapro.com and get the three-page synopsis. You can watch the Ashes of Chikara. You can get the mobile app, which is just ninety-nine cents, and now an ebook called Press Start, which uh, I'm going to have to check out myself. 
Well, let me tell you about this. There was some kind of file incompatibility with Kindle Direct Publishing that cannot be resolved. It is a fatal flaw. Oh, my God. And it has been pulled from Amazon. So we are trying to figure out another way to get that out to people, and we should probably have a solution for that within a day. So who knows? Maybe by the time this reaches your ear holes, you will be able to get that <laughs> new Chikara ebook because there was just something – Amazon tech people couldn't figure it out. Our people couldn't figure it out. And we just said, yeah, yeah. Goodnight. Nothing's an accident in Chikara. That's uh, <laughs> a, it's all a work. It's all a work. Amazon has very, they know exactly what they're doing. Uh, mm-hmm. You can't fool me. <laughs> but uh, Mr. Quagmush, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a, it was a true pleasure talking to you. And I, I look forward to uh, meeting you in person uh, down in Philadelphia. I look forward to it as well. Thanks a lot, Will. Thank you. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Mm-hmm. Bye now. Bye. More on Will Newman at willnewman.com. I said more on. <laughs> <laughs>